text today in our ongoing series from the Gospel of John is from chapter 19, from verse 31 to 37. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Let us pray. Lord, as we contemplate the wonder of the cross today, as we consider again what you've done for us, we pray that you'd penetrate our hearts with your truth by your spirit, draw us ever closer to you, and remind us of the peace that we have in Christ and in Christ alone. We ask this in his name. Amen. Somebody once said that if you squeezed the Gospel of John hard enough, water would pour out of it. The, the symbolism of water is a recurring theme throughout John, beginning with Jesus' first recorded miracle when he turned water into wine in chapter 2. In chapter 4, he told the Samaritan woman at Sychar that he offers living water to those who come to him in faith. In the next chapter, he healed the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. The superstitious belief was that this pool had magical healing powers, but being paralyzed, the man was unable to get into the pool by himself. So in a very real way, Jesus took the place of the alleged healing powers of the water, and he himself then healed the man. In chapter 7 at the Feast of Tabernacles, publicly Jesus proclaimed, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In chapter 9, he healed the man born blind by telling him to wash in the pool of Siloam. And then, of course, he used water to wash the feet of his disciples in John chapter 13, which, as we looked at last Sunday, makes the irony of his plea on the cross, I thirst, even more remarkable. John has meticulously, meticulously listed many occasions of the spiritual life-giving water that Jesus offers us, only to thirst himself as he bore the curse of human sin. The very source of life-giving water, as he was dying, was denied water to drink. But of course we know that it was by that same death of our Savior that we are able to come to him for the spiritual water of life that we need. John then records in verse 37 the soldier piercing Jesus' side with a spear. Now, medical experts tell us that the separation of blood and water proves that Jesus was actually dead, which is something John stressed in the previous verse. But there's a lot more to this detail than first meets the eye. James Montgomery Boyce wrote, The breaking of the legs was to hasten death, as John indicates. The only reason Jesus' legs were not broken was that, was that he was already dead. And then he makes an important point. But lest there be any doubt, the spear was thrust into his side by the soldier, all carefully recorded by John. Why is this important? It was important in view of the later claims regarding the resurrection. Jesus had not merely swooned to revive later in the cool of the tomb and then emerged to appear to his disciples as if he had been raised from the dead. He had really died and he was really resurrected. So there's an easy answer to the question, why didn't the Roman soldiers break Jesus' legs? It's because he was already dead. Pilate had given them an order, and they would not have disobeyed it if they were not certain that Jesus was already dead. We mustn't forget that these men were professional executioners. They were very familiar with this particular form of execution. They knew a dead man when they saw one. It was their professional opinion, based upon years of experience, that Jesus Christ was dead, and he had not fainted or swooned as some people teach. Now, we've spent a lot of time in recent weeks on the significance of the blood of Christ, which secures our salvation. But John also makes the point of water flowing from his side. Now, other than proving the actual physical death of Jesus, 
What else does this teach us? The blood that flowed reminds us of his sacrificial death, the cleansing power of his blood, which purifies us from the penalty of our sin. The water that flowed out reminds us of our sins being washed as white as snow, of the living water of the Spirit that Jesus spoke about in John chapter 4, which wells up within us to eternal life. And there are connections here to the Old Testament as well. In Exodus chapter 17, the people complained to Moses that they had no water. So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take, your stock, take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Notice in verse 6, God said to Moses, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it. God offered himself to be struck in the place of his sinful people, with the result that life-giving water flowed out of the rock. And this is a clear picture of what happened at Calvary. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, took on human flesh and offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. And having been physically struck and beaten by the Roman soldiers, in death the water of life flows, as does the blood which brings forgiveness for our sins. Later on, the Apostle Paul makes the connection between the death of Jesus and the rock that Moses struck in Exodus 17. When he writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Most English translations capitalize the word rock there. There was a Jewish legend that an actual physical rock which provided water followed the Jews throughout the Exodus, but that has no biblical basis. Warren Wearsby, in his commentary, he says, Paul did not suggest in 1 Corinthians 10.4 that an actual rock accompanied the Jews throughout their wilderness journey, though some Jewish rabbis taught this idea. It was a spiritual rock that supplied what they needed, and that rock was Christ. And that rock who is Christ is with us and within us today as the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. John then writes in verse 36, these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. What were these things that took place? John here is referring to the piercing of Jesus' side and the fact that the Roman soldiers didn't find it necessary to break Jesus' legs as they did with the two men crucified with him. But why is this important? Crucifixion was probably the most cruel and painful method of execution which has ever been invented. The word excruciating finds its roots in this dreadful practice. Crucifixion was the Romans' chosen means of executing those that they wanted to make an example of. And public crucifixion was a powerful deterrent against crime and rebellion against Rome, because it was such an awful way to die. And depending on how badly the condemned person was beaten before being nailed to the cross, it could take several days to die. Now, Jesus, as we know, was severely flogged and tortured before going to the cross, which meant that his death came relatively quickly, in about six hours. But there's also some significant, there's a significant difference between the death of Jesus on the cross and the usual means of treating those who had been crucified. Usually, in order to emphasize the warning to everyone else who might be considering opposing the Romans, they would leave the dead bodies on the cross long after death even to the point where the bodies would begin to decay and would be eaten by vultures. Now, as we've seen, in Palestine, the Roman oppressors gave the Jewish religious leaders some latitude. They allowed them to practice some of their own mosaic laws and traditions, so long as they didn't directly oppose Roman law. And one example is when Pilate allowed them to ensure that Jesus was dead before the Sabbath by instructing the soldiers to break his, Jesus' legs. And also, this wasn't any ordinary Sabbath. This particular Sabbath signaled the beginning of Passover week. And we looked at Deuteronomy 21 last week. 
If a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree. This is the problem that the, the, the Pharisees had. But you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. And this is an important phrase. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Also, it was against the law of Moses to perform any executions on a religious feast day. That's why in verse 31, it says, Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. When his legs were broken with a heavy mallet or an iron bar, a crucified man could no longer press down with his feet in order to lift himself up to breathe, meaning he would die of suffocation. Once more here we see the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. And this is actually the last time in the Gospel of John that he writes about it. The hypocrisy is seen in the fact that in their eagerness to prevent the land from being defiled, as we read in Deuteronomy 21, 23, they ignored the fact that their crime of killing the innocent Lamb of God actually defiled them. They respected the law, but not the lawgiver. Pilate, though, couldn't care less whether Jesus died before sunset or not, which marked the beginning of, Sabbath, of the Sabbath and the Passover week. And so he gave his permission. The legs of the thieves were broken, which ensured an early death for them. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already, had already died, so they didn't break his legs. And instead, one of them thrust a spear into his side. Now, some say it was to make sure that he really was dead. Others believe this is possibly just a final insult to Jesus, even in death. But John tells us that this was to fulfill the scriptures. And speaking of himself in verse 35, he says, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. So here again, we see the hand of God orchestrating all of these events. As Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. So it wasn't just the fact that Jesus died, but how he died and how his body was treated after death. All of this was preordained by God and prophesied hundreds of years before. Wiersbe again writes, It is remarkable that the Roman soldiers did not do what they were commanded to do, break the victim's legs, but they did do what they were not supposed to do, pierce the Saviour's side. In both matters they fulfilled the very word of God. The bones of the Passover lamb were not to be broken in accordance with Exodus 12.46, and his side was pierced as prophesied in Zechariah 12 verse 10. The Bible teacher John Corson makes an interesting point on the fact that none of Jesus' bones were broken. He says, John takes four or five verses to make it clear that just as prophesied, not a bone of Jesus was broken. Why is this so important? Because where is blood continually produced in the body? It's produced in the bone. Therefore, God mandated not a bone of his would be broken, ensuring a perpetual and inexhaustible supply of blood. That's why Paul could later declare, where sin abounds, grace abounds yet more. Truly, the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cleanse you from every sin you have ever committed or will commit, because not a bone of his was broken. Psalm 34, verses 19 and 20. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Now, it's easy to make the connection here, but there's an important word in verse 19. Righteous. Jesus, the perfect God-man, is the only perfectly righteous man to have ever lived. And as 1 Peter 3.18 reminds us, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. The sinless, innocent, righteous Son of God died a criminal's death. He was the righteous one. We are the unrighteous, those for whom he suffered and died. And also in, in Exodus 12, at the very first Passover, when the angel of death passed over the homes of the Israelites, who had put the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorposts, 
Verse 46 says, It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. Jesus died on the cross on the day of preparation, the eve of Passover. Now, for centuries, the Jews had meticulously followed the detailed instructions passed on by Moses on how the Passover meal was to be observed. Every year it was identical. There was never a change. But now, at Calvary, for those who had the eyes of faith to see the true Passover lamb and the ultimate meaning of it was being fulfilled right there in front of John's eyes. And that's why he wrote in verse 35, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. By his holy, precious blood and through his innocent suffering and death, we are set free from the condemnation our sins deserve. His blood marks our doorposts. Death passes over us and we are brought out of our bondage to sin and death as God by his spirit leads us out into the new life that we have in Christ. It's our own personal exodus from slavery to sin to freedom in the ultimate promised land. In heaven, the new Jerusalem. That is this tremendous hope that we have because of what Christ has done for us. And then in verse 37, John refers to another ancient prophecy when he writes, They will look on him whom they have pierced. And he's referring here to Zechariah 12, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. What Zechariah was writing about here was the prophesied rejection of the Jewish people of their own Messiah. While at the same time, the Lord, through Zechariah, promises grace and mercy, and will come specifically through the preaching of the word of God and the proclamation of the gospel. And we see that in the next chapter, in the verses 1 and 2 of Zechariah, Zechariah 13. On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, so that they shall be remembered no more. And also I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. Just as John recorded the blood and water that flowed from Jesus' crucified body, and as Zechariah foretold the preaching of the cross for cleansing and salvation, today, as the gospel is preached and believed, that fountain of life and truth continues to flow, so that all who look on him, all will look on him whom they have pierced. It is at the cross where the awful yet glorious truth of the reason for the death of Jesus breaks us, as we mourn over our sins. You remember we close with a, a simple yet profound quote by Charles Spurgeon last week. Jesus died for me. That's the truth that each of us needs to see when we look upon him whom they've pierced. It is as the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and of our need of a saviour that the cross of Jesus Christ will make perfect sense. You cannot be saved until you look upon him whom they have pierced. And that is why the cross and all that it means remains the central message of the church. Those who turn to God in repentance and faith do mourn and weep over their sin. But it is through that mourning that God brings redemption and cleansing through the fountain that Zechariah wrote about. The result of which we find in Zechariah 13 verse 9. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. There is, however, a stern warning in John's words in 19, John 19.37 to those who refuse the gift of forgiveness which Jesus offers. They will look upon him whom they have pierced. You will either look at Jesus Christ and him crucified in awe and wonder and gratitude for the salvation he offers you, or you will look upon him and mourn of your eternal destruction when he returns in glory. Confess him as Lord and Saviour. Because it is only he who can save you. When Jesus returns for his own, it will be too late. 
And that same John wrote in Revelation 1 verse 7, connecting us all the way back to the cross. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Jesus died for you. Will you confess, and will you believe that? Let us pray. Father, we thank you that it is through Christ and Christ alone that you have saved us. We thank you for the blood which flowed. We thank you for the reminder of our desperate need for salvation and that you have offered us mercy and grace through your only Son. We thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross. Thank you for the hope that we have in and through you. We pray that you would deepen our faith and our trust in you, that you would give us boldness as we share the hope of the gospel with those who have yet to gaze upon you and to see their desperate need and the way that you have so miraculously provided for our great need. Thank you that you've saved us. Thank you, Lord, that you've redeemed us. And we give you thanks in his most precious name. Amen.